Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're going to be talking about laptop versus desktop GPU performance, a revisit of a topic that we last covered on the channel more than a year ago when Nvidia first released their GeForce RTX discrete GPUs for laptops. That investigation was prompted by Nvidia's confusing naming scheme, where laptop and desktop GPUs had the exact same name but featured vastly different performance. In that video, using hardware available in the early parts of 2019, we found that the RTX 2070 for desktops was, on average, 19% faster than the RTX 2070 for laptops at 1080p. This grew to a whopping 42% difference when comparing the desktop RTX 2070 to Nvidia's low-power RTX 2070 Max-Q variant. Since that point, there have been some refreshes to laptop and desktop hardware. On the GPU side, Nvidia has released the RTX Super line for both desktops and, more recently, laptops. This very latest wave of gaming laptops for 2020 uses Super GPUs at the high end, in the form of the RTX 2070 Super and RTX 2080 Super, which we've covered previously on the channel. We also are seeing new CPU options through Intel's 10th generation, and also the return of AMD to gaming laptops in a big way with Ryzen 4000. Despite all these refreshes, Nvidia continues to mislead customers with their GPU naming scheme. In 2020, you can buy laptops that feature RTX 2070 Super GPUs inside. Sometimes you'll get a Max-Q variant, sometimes you won't. This continues across the entire line, from below the GTX 1660 Ti right up to the highest option, the RTX 2080 Super. To some customers that aren't as familiar with Nvidia's GPU lineup, at a glance it looks like these laptops are offering the same GPU and therefore the same performance as what you'd get from an equivalent desktop gaming PC. But that's far from the case. Let's take the RTX 2070 Super as an example. While both the desktop and laptop variants use the same physical GPU, so the same 12 nanometer TU-104 die complete with 2560 CUDA cores, other aspects are very different. The desktop card features a 215 watt power limit, which allows the GPU to clock at 1770 MHz boost or higher. The laptop variant has a power limit anywhere from 80 to 115 watts, with boost clocks between 1155 and 1380 MHz. This means that purely based on rated clock speeds, the desktop card can clock 28% higher in the best case, and potentially over 50% higher if we compare it to the lowest power mobile configuration. Memory configurations can also differ. Again, the base design is similar. Both variants deliver 8GB of GDDR6 memory on a 256-bit bus. But if you get a low-power Max-Q mobile variant of the RTX 2070 Super, you'll see just 11 gigabits per second memory used, compared to 14 gigabits per second on the desktop. This reduces memory bandwidth in addition to featuring lower GPU clock speeds. I could go on with examples from across the rest of the lineup, but you can see the issue here. Nvidia feels that by using the same physical GPU with the same number of shaders, they can brand their laptop GPUs the same as their desktop GPUs, despite vastly different power targets, clock speeds, and ultimately performance. At best, this is confusing for buyers, and at worst, they could be tricked into buying a product that doesn't deliver the level of performance they were expecting. So we're going to unravel in today's video the exact performance difference you can come to expect between Nvidia's desktop and laptop GPUs of the same name, covering all options from the GTX 1660 Ti up through to the RTX 2080 Super. Hopefully this will make it much clearer for you when buying as to the level of performance you're getting. No more getting misled into thinking the RTX 2080 Super for laptops gets even close to that same GPU in a desktop. Like our previous comparisons between desktops and laptops, this isn't designed to be a direct GPU comparison where we lock down the desktop platform to the same specifications and level of performance you'd get from a laptop. There's no CPU downclocking or power limiting here. This is designed to be a realistic comparison between desktop and laptop platforms. This means that yes, the desktop PC will also have a more powerful CPU with better cooling and faster memory. That's how these systems are generally configured in the real world, so these results will show you the actual difference between a gaming laptop and a gaming desktop, not between a gaming laptop and a weird GIMPs desktop. With that said, we haven't gone all out with our desktop test system to absolutely crush the laptop systems. Our desktop platform for this video is configured with a relatively modest Intel Core i5-10600K, along with 16GB of dual-channel DDR4-3200 memory with XMP enabled. 
we chose these components to roughly match what is on offer in most gaming laptops. Typically, you get an Intel 6-core CPU, like the Core i7-10750H, at most reasonable price points, while 16GB of memory is a common starting point as well. Of course, there are lots of other configurations possible, but this fits the best with what we have. And then on the laptop side, usual test notes apply here. We try and configure these laptops as apples to apples as possible, so everything has dual channel memory, decent airflow into the coolers, and is set to stock power settings. The results you see in the charts are an average of the systems with the same configuration. The full list of laptops we tested is in the description. Let's kick off the benchmarks here with Red Dead Redemption 2, the first of six games we'll explore in depth before showing summaries with the full 18 games I tested. The first thing you'll note here is that alongside each CPU and GPU configuration, there are power limits, which show the maximum sustained power draw we saw from these components. For laptops, generally both the CPU and GPU will run right up to this limit indefinitely, so that could mean 45 watts on the CPU and 90 watts on the GPU. However, with our desktop platform, how close a CPU or GPU comes to reaching the limit will depend on the game and its utilization. For example, while the RTX 2070 Super is listed here with the desktop variant as 215 watts, in many games its actual power consumption is lower than that. Anyway, what we're looking at here is Red Dead Redemption 2 running at 1080p high settings with the Vulkan renderer. What you might have noticed straight away is that we have three desktop configurations sitting right at the top of the chart. The RTX 2070 Super and RTX 2080 Super deliver breakaway performance here. But even the RTX 2070 comes in marginally ahead of the fastest laptop configuration we've tested in 2020, which has the Core i9-10980HK and RTX 2080 Super Max-Q running at 90 watts. Moving down the chart, we have the RTX 2060 desktop configuration in the middle, delivering slightly more performance than the RTX 2070 Super Max Q. In this test, the desktop RTX 2060 is only 4% ahead of the RTX 2060 for laptops, which as we'll come to see is an outlier. Meanwhile, the GTX 1660 Ti is sitting around 8% ahead of its laptop counterpart. Next up we have Control, which is one of the most GPU demanding titles in our suite. We're not even close to being CPU limited here, especially on laptops. Starting from the bottom, you'll see that the desktop GTX 1660 Ti outperforms the laptop variant by 14%, allowing it to slot in ahead of the lower power RTX 2060 configurations. So if you get a laptop with an 80 watt RTX 2060, you aren't quite at the level of a desktop GTX 1660 Ti. One up the desktop stack is the RTX 2060, and here it pulls away from the fastest laptop configuration of this GPU, to the tune of a 13% margin. The RTX 2060 desktop is notably faster than the RTX 2070 for laptops, and RTX 2070 Super Max-Q as well. In fact, the RTX 2060 is delivering more like RTX 2080 Super Max-Q type performance, fitting right alongside those GPUs. Then for the high-end stuff, it's a bit of a bloodbath for the laptop variants. Our desktop RTX 2070 GPU is 30% faster in this title, pulling well ahead due to its much higher power limits of 175 watts versus 115 watts. Then for the super desktop GPUs compared to their 90 watt max Q equivalents in laptops, the margin grows to over 40% in favor of the desktop model. Simply put, if you buy an RTX 2080 Super Max Q laptop, you're not even in the ballpark of RTX 2080 Super desktop performance. In Metro Exodus, you can also expect to see large margins between the laptop and desktop variants, which grows at each successive step. The GTX 1660 Ti for desktops is 14% faster than the laptop model. Then for the RTX 2060, it's 17% faster. For the RTX 2070, we're up to 31% faster, then 41% for the RTX 2070 Super versus RTX 2070 Super Max Q, and 35% for RTX 2080 Super versus RTX 2080 Super Max Q. These are very substantial margins in favor of the desktop configuration, especially at the high end. The performance difference for a card like the RTX 2070 is Quite frankly ridiculous given they both have the exact same name, no Max-Q branding here. The 115 watt power limit for the laptop GPU doesn't allow it to get even close to the desktop card and really, it's hard to say the laptop model is delivering true RTX 2070-like performance. 
Shadow of the Tomb Raider is an interesting case in that the game is also heavy on the CPU, to the point where at 1080p, our high-end configurations are CPU limited in our benchmark and deliver roughly the same performance. But what you'll also see, even for the lower end models, is that the desktop GPUs in combination with the Core i5-10600K deliver much higher 1% low performance than the laptop models. Take the RTX 2060 for example. Looking at average frame rates, the desktop card is 18% faster than the laptop variant at 115 watts. But for 1% lows, the desktop platform is 35% faster as the CPU is also able to better keep up with the demanding sections of the benchmark pass. There are plenty of situations like this across modern games where desktops don't just have a big GPU advantage in games, but a big CPU advantage as well. Battlefield 5 is another game where you'll get much more consistent frame times with a desktop PC than you will with a laptop. For example, the 1% low of our desktop system with an RTX 2060 is nearly as high as the average frame rate you get with the same GPU in a laptop. Of course, then on top of that we see much higher average frame rates. The RTX 2060 is 16% faster here on average, and this grows with higher end configurations as we've seen from many of these benchmarks. The final game I wanted to explore in depth is Borderlands 3, which is another game where the top 4 desktop configurations all sit at the top of the chart, and where even a GTX 1660 Ti desktop paired with a Core i5 processor is able to outperform a decent RTX 2070 gaming laptop. Like Red Dead Redemption 2 was a bit of an outlier on the lower end of performance margins, Borderlands 3 is a bit of an outlier the other way, with over a 25% advantage in the RTX 2060 class to the desktop platform. Now time for some performance breakdowns that will illustrate the difference between the desktop and laptop GPUs across a range of games. With the GTX 1660 Ti, we're looking at the desktop variant being 14% faster on average when looking at average frame rates. In some titles like GTA 5, that margin is just low single digits. In others like Hitman 2 and Borderlands 3, the difference is more like 20%. But throughout our testing, on average, the laptop GTX 1660 Ti isn't quite at the level of the desktop card. Next up is the RTX 2060, comparing the desktop card to the fastest laptop configuration available today with a 115 watt power limit. The desktop card is on average 18% faster, which is quite a substantial difference between the variants given they both have the same name. This is often the difference between below 60fps and above 60fps with a title like Control. And comparing the desktop RTX 2060 to the lower power 80 watt variant of the RTX 2060 for laptops, the margins are larger at 32% in favour of the desktop card. With such a large difference, it's a bit silly to call the much slower RTX 2060 80 watt the same name as the desktop card that consume up to twice the power. In the RTX 2070 class, when testing with a more modern set of games, the desktop card is now approximately 25% faster on average, with particularly large gains in titles such as Borderlands 3, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and Control. And when putting the desktop card up against the low power 80 watt max Q variant of this GPU, the difference is substantial, with the desktop card pulling ahead by 38% on average. For the RTX 2070 Super, we only currently have data for low power Max-Q laptops that let this GPU run up to 90 watts. In this instance, the desktop card comes in 35% faster on average, putting the low power model to shame. In the most GPU demanding titles of recent years, the desktop PC can pull ahead by 40-50% to in some instances, so this Max-Q model really is not delivering RTX 2070 Super-like performance. Similar story with the RTX 2080 Super. Margins are a little smaller here than with the RTX 2070 Super, but still, the desktop variant is 29% faster than the laptop Max-Q variant running at 90 watts. Again, at times, the margin can be as high as 50%. This begs the question, where do the laptop GPUs actually align in terms of the desktop GeForce lineup? We've seen that laptop GPUs like the RTX 2070 are so far away from their desktop brother that calling them both the same name could be misleading, so let's take a look. In terms of performance, the RTX 2060 at 115 watts is most like a GTX 1660 Ti from the desktop line, plus the inclusion of ray tracing support and tensor cores which the GTX 1660 Ti doesn't have. This means that anything below the RTX 2060 115 watt, including the 80 watt model, and the laptop GTX 1660 Ti is more in line with lower end GTX series GPUs that we didn't test for this video. The RTX 2070 for laptops at 115 watts sits in between the GTX 1660 Ti and the RTX 2060. 
Here we can see the GTX 1660 Ti for desktops is 5% slower on average, but I'll also mention the RTX 2060 is about 10% faster, so it's closer to 1660 Ti than it is to RTX 2060. Meanwhile, the Max-Q variant of the RTX 2070 is well within GTX 1660 Ti territory and is, in fact, slower on average. Then right at the top of the stack, the RTX 2080 Super Max-Q delivers roughly equivalent performance to the desktop RTX 2060, although it is faster in some titles. Despite this, at no stage does the 2080 Super Max-Q outperform the desktop RTX 2070, and in the worst cases, gets easily beat. This then places the RTX 2070 Super Max Q below the RTX 2060. Overall, you can see why I'm frustrated at Nvidia's naming scheme for mobile class GPUs, and why I've mentioned this multiple times over the last few years. When comprehensively exploring how the desktop line stacks up against the mobile line, it's clear that even when two GPUs have the same name, you just aren't getting desktop class performance from the laptop product. The desktop cards end up 15 to 35% faster depending on the comparison, and the inclusion of new super GPUs into the lineup appears to be widening the gap. This means that in reality, each laptop GPU is actually delivering the performance of a desktop GPU several rungs below in the lineup. An RTX 2070 for laptops more closely lines up with a GTX 1660 Ti for desktops. The RTX 2080 Super Max Q is in line with an RTX 2060 and so on. In my opinion, this is quite misleading for buyers, especially those buyers that have heard about the performance of certain GPUs or have looked up much more common desktop performance figures. When you're just getting started in the PC gaming ecosystem, all this jargon and names and all that can be pretty confusing, and Nvidia are only adding a layer of confusion on top here with their naming choices. And let's be honest. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with the actual GPUs. The performance on offer is decent for 1080p gaming on the go, while the 1660 Ti or RTX 2060 for laptops may not stack up well against the desktop cards. In many games, you're getting at least a 60fps experience with ultra-type settings. In some titles, you're looking at well above 100fps. Given that some of these laptops are sub 2 kilograms and very portable, the performance on offer is impressive at times, and even a modest mid-range system is highly capable in today's games. And I get why Nvidia don't call these parts for what they are, and don't use desktop performance equivalent naming. Saying there's just a mere RTX 2060 in a $3,000 gaming notebook probably wouldn't go down well given a desktop with the same GPU can be built for a third of the price. Calling that GPU an RTX 2080 Super instead, using that expensive silicon and slapping on some confusing with Max-Q design branding at the end does equal more sales. In my opinion, the best middle ground here would be to go back to the M naming. RTX 2070M, RTX 2060M. Easy to understand, the M immediately signifies to buyers that the GPU isn't the same as the desktop card, but resides in the same performance class as the desktop GPU relative to others in the lineup. It just makes more sense, it's not as misleading, buyers are less likely to be burned when they don't get the performance they have expected, and yeah, moving away from that branding I think was a bit of a mistake. Naming aside, hopefully from watching this video you now have an idea where a gaming laptop should slot in compared to a desktop PC you might be more familiar with, or vice versa. There's really no right or wrong answer as to whether you should buy a gaming laptop or gaming desktop, given they serve completely different markets and use cases, but it is nice to know the actual differences in performance on offer, not just performance assumptions made, I guess, based on the component names. That's it for this one. If you're interested in yeah, checking out the rest of our laptop coverage, we've been doing a fair bit of that. Got a few more things coming up shortly, so if you're interested, you can subscribe to the channel. Also, if you're interested in supporting us, we do have our Patreon page. Links to that are in the description below. You can get access to our Discord chat, monthly live streams, behind-the-scenes videos, and all that sort of thing. That's it. I'll catch you in the next one.